Last week, we tried to summarize those long, dismal centuries which followed the collapse of the Roman Empire and finally culminated in the general decline of European culture. We pointed out that it would not be fair to say that nothing occurred between the years 600 and 1200 that would have an effect upon future time. The roots of all that came after had to be in this dark and rather dismal earth. But we do know that gradually a condition of frustration locked European culture. Man isolated uh, from the natural intellectual associations of his kind, reduced almost completely to illiteracy. Having lost the guiding power of earlier scholarship and classical learning, found himself shut off, cut off from practically all inducements to grow. He fell into a kind of stagnation. And while exceptional individuals survived this condition, the general tone of Europe was so lowered that a revulsion was almost inevitable. We observe from the study of natural facts that there are alternations, tides in the affairs of men. And when a pendulum swings far in one direction, it pauses. And from this gaining a contrary momentum, swings equally far in the opposite direction. The year 1200 more or less marks the swing of the pendulum, a complete change from the preceding centuries, a change perhaps imperceptibly achieved, yet punctuated with a number of violent and powerful occurrences, some of them good, some of them to our thinking not good, but all of them stimulating helping to break patterns and release the mind into the first adventure of a larger world. Thus, in this cycle of the phoenix, we find the roots and beginnings of Western internationalism. We find the provincial person being forced by numerous circumstances out of the ancient ruts and patterns which had dominated him. He found an acquaintance with a greater way of life, and having found this acquaintance, even though he paid for it with his life, the great motions of Western culture uh, regained a better and more rapid pace. So we take the year 1200 as being a hypothetical point to represent this next return of the phoenix. And if we strike directly at this year itself, we are not very far from the very critical year in which many of these occurrences were taking shape. For example, in the year 1200, Genghis Khan was 40 years old. The effect of Genghis Khan upon the world was prodigious. Not only should he be regarded as a Mongol conqueror, a very astute statesman, a brilliant uh, man of strategy, and a ruthless conqueror. We must not consider merely these aspects of his character. We must see in him that which he saw in himself, a man of destiny. There can be no doubt but the great cluster of five stars that marked his birth had meaning. 
Nor can we easily explain the fact that he was born into this world clutching in one hand a ruby gem, the mystery of which no one has ever been able to solve. But obviously the soothsayers of the desert and the far places where his banners flew saw in these and many other portents the finger of fate pointing out a man. Genghis Khan was born of humble desert parentage. There was nothing in his background uh, to indicate that he would sometime be master of two-thirds of the known earth. There was very little hope, in fact, that he would gain distinction. And by almost a miracle, his life was spared in childhood, hence the entire history of Europe would have been differently written. But Genghis Khan believed himself to have a mission. And as Kar Khan of Tatary, he signed himself King of Kings, Son of the Sun. He was driven by those ambitions which are quite usual to our Western concept, but not so prevalent to this degree in Eastern thinking. From him descended other conquerors, to mention too Kublai Khan, the Magnificent, and Tamerlane, or Timur Shah, the Shaker of the Earth. These Mongols, on their shaggy ponies, broke through the great wastes of Asia, bound together the desert tribes and wandering nomadic peoples, forced into them one great arterial system of laws, prepared for them a great cold, which Genghis Khan called the cold of the books of iron. Now this did not mean swords or military machines, but ancient tablets in which strange characters were inscribed upon surfaces of rough iron. The books of iron gave to Asia a great document of common law, of legality, of reasonable procedure in great many details. And if ruthlessness afflicted great groups, those who came finally under the banner of the great Khans found life better ordered, merchandising safer, fewer bandits on the road, and furthermore, great inducements to travel, to study, to improve, to elevate themselves in various ways. Had Genghis Khan been a statesman over a stable empire, he probably would have been one of the greatest intellectual leaders of his time, perhaps of modern time. But so much of his life was spent upon the battlefield that he had little time other than in abstract theory to integrate the policies for the administration of the territories which he occupied. He did leave, however, a heritage to Kublai Khan. And we cannot but remember the episode in which, seated upon the back of a great elephant, Kublai Khan, speaking with all the authority of his ancestors, proclaimed for Asia, total Asia, the great code of religious tolerance, perhaps the first of its kind, certainly in that region. At that time, the empire of the great Khans cut through many religions, Brahmins, Confucianists, Taoists, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Christians, Jews. They were all part of the great Oriental Empire that had been fashioned by the genius of a desert nomad. And Kublai Khan, seated upon his great elephant, proclaimed for all these people absolutely equal rights. He proclaimed saying 
let no man be in any way penalized, adjudged inferior, despised, disregarded, subjected to insult because of his religion or his race. Now, for those ancient times, that was not just the word of a soldier. It was the word of a statesman, a man of vision, more vision, perhaps, than existed in Europe in the same years. Certainly he meant what he said, because he put behind this a very strong <coughs> determination, establishing heavy penalty for disobedience to his law. And he said, let any man who speaks slightingly of the just faith of another just man be penalized, imprisoned, fined, and if necessary, deprived of his own citizenship. We'll have nothing of this in the empire. So here in dark Asia of that day, Something happened, and this happening did not remain there, for we know that the floods of the great Mongol armies broke against the bulwarks of Eastern Europe, that a contact was established, and it had not, had it not been for Poland and Hungary, the Europe, history of Europe after the 13th century might have been written in Mongolian. It was a very critical and dangerous crisis. But it meant that Asia moved against the ramparts of Christendom. East and West met, not as friends, as it is true, but they met. And from this meeting became aware of each other, became aware of the values within each other. And when the great tide of the Mongol armies gradually subsided, Certain re remnants remain behind, and in the blood of many great Teutonic families is the Mongol strain. In many cases, fraternity, friendship, and affection sprang up between individuals, even in this difficult crisis. And something happened to Europe also. It beheld a world beyond itself, a world it knew nothing about. A world, even if it had some inkling of its existence, was regarded as meaningless, purposeless, outside of the boundaries of hope and salvation, merely barbarism, helpless, simply waiting Europe's pleasure to civilize it. The European received a shock, and the shock did him a great deal of good, basically. It was a terrible shock, but it was an important one. This, in turn, led to other situations. And although we are not able to cover every aspect of this theory and this problem, we must remember that it was the Mongols who established uh, the northern Buddhistic hierarchy at Lhasa in Tibet, creating Lamaism. And it was by these Lamas, by the Grand Lama of Lhasa, that the Mongol kings were crowned. It was also the pleasure of the Mongol to bring into Asia European scholars, statesmen, and even a few rare travelers. And we know that even in the court of Genghis Khan, a court mostly upon the backs of horses and of elephants, Europeans, Christians, Muslims, and Jews rode with the emperor. They were his counselors. They were in many respects his trusted advisors. And such was a precedent that continued even as late as the great Mughal Empire in India. So we can only say in passing of the impact of the Kar Khan or the Great Khan upon Europe was this breaking of traditions, this breaking through of isolation, and furthermore, the psychological situation, which would be difficult for us to imagine. Genghis Khan, second only to Julius Caesar, perhaps, perhaps his equal, in the organization 
of military phalanx and related matters, moved across Asia and sent his great lines against the walls of Christendom in a fantastic manner. His foreguard, or his advanced troop, when he went into battle, consisted of 10,000 elephants side by side, their bodies touching and their tusks covered with steel. A solid wall, and on the back of each, a fighting tower with men. This wall of elephants moving against an adversary was not exactly reassuring. And in they, those days would have been the equal of the same number of military tanks moving against yeomen with bows and arrows. It was an incredible situation. But the whole world was shaking. In China, there are ancient battlefields which we can scarcely trace except by arrowheads and broken lance points and bits of rusted armor and fragments of decayed bamboo. But we know from the earthworks and from the various remains that on some of those battlefields, which are 300 miles long, three to four million men met in combat at a single time. This was shaking away. This was a movement in Asia, a movement which challenged not only Mongol political supremacy, but challenged the philosophies, the arts, the cultures, the religions of all these involved peoples, stirring up faith where it had been weak, causing men to turn to God from their barter and exchange, and demanding a great revival of faith within these areas to sustain a torn and broken world. Now while all this was going on in Asia, our year 1200 strikes Europe in Walsall, one of its most desperate situations, the Great Crusades. Now we read a little of the Crusades in an occasional romantic work, talking of shaking swords and glittering lances. But uh, from the broader standpoint of things, certainly from the standpoint of military strategy, the Crusades were the greatest fiasco in the history of the world. Nothing was a more dismal failure. Nothing went forth with greater hope, with greater glory with prancing horses, silver armor, and coroneted knights. But as the um, Saracen himself pointed out, though Europe sends 70 kings, Asia was great enough to be a burial place for them all. That's what happened. The Crusades were motivated objectively and presumably by the great desire to liberate the Holy Land from the holdings of the unbeliever. Here was an impact of religious prejudice such as we have never seen since and hope never to see again. Here also, ignorance rode in the vanguard and directed nearly everything. First of all, the Eastern man was ignorant of the Western man. The Westerner totally ignorant of the Easterner. Crude woodblock prints, drawings, and various literary descriptions indicate that Europe regarded the Moslem at that time as a dragon that belched fire and made horrible howling noises and that uh, he was little better than a low order of demon in disguise. He existed only to flout his false doctrines against the true faith. He was a savage. He was a cruel, horrible barbarian. He was an individual less than a slave. He was of no account to Europe. And yet Europe was forced, finally, to meet him face to face by the machinery of the Crusades. The purpose for which these 
enterprises uh, were created failed in every sense, but the greater purpose was ultimately achieved. At the critical time we mention, we are very close, within a few years, to the crusade that was led by the Duke of Montserrat and Richard the Lionhearted of England. One of the crucial crusades. Crusades that comes a little earlier and were to continue a little later. But about all they were able to produce was a temporary kingdom of Jerusalem which lasted 15 years. Everything else was a dismal disappointment. Most of those who went forth on the Crusades, except perhaps a few of the most aristocratic leaders, did not return. Families lost their loved ones and their support. Men went out to fight in the desert, and there they died, either from the skill of the Saracen or from the natural hazards of the region. In the midst of this tremendous emotional upheaval came the child or crusade or the crusade of the children. Two groups attempted this. Children hardly out of their teens, fired with religious fervor, decided that they would go and save the Holy Land. These children were mostly captured and sold into slavery. Nothing happened except to break apart the little tight package of European isolation. In the breaking apart of this package, however, a very important achievement came, as we will see a little later. First of all, the crusaders, going forth to meet these savages, these barbarians, these fire-belching monsters, found instead the highly cultivated peoples of the great empire of Baghdad, and those who had long uh, been under the instruction and enlightenment of one of the most literate and advanced social groups at that time. The Crusaders in the Great Crusade at the time we mentioned came face to face with another Asiatic who proved exceedingly troublesome, and this was Saladin the Magnificent. Saladin the Magnificent outmaneuvered, outgeneraled both Richard and the uh, Duke of Montserrat and all the other seventy princes and kings who had vowed that they would rescue the Holy Sepulchre. Richard was perhaps the most intelligent man in this crusade. And he finally came to the realization that he was dealing with an intelligent man. This was a discovery which the others had not made. And Saladin admired Richard. The men met under truce, became in a strange way adversaries and friends and mutual admirers. So far that Richard uh, seriously considered the possibility of marrying a member of his royal household to the Saracen Emperor. These men met with a full realization of their own mutual abilities and limitations. The Crusaders learned, for example, that their enemies were literate. They were not. They realized that these monsters, so-called, wrote poetry, studied science, measured the stars, developed great physicians, and scholars, mystics, that they were the ones who could quote Plato and Aristotle into a Christian ear that had never heard either. It was a great surprise. And finally, when arbitration was arrived, and the roads of pilgrimage to Jerusalem were opened to Christians. It was not because of the victory of the Crusaders, but because of the religious tolerance and generosity of Saladin, who could see no good reason why those who loved their God should not have the right to journey to his shrine. So Saladin made possible that measure of success 
which marked the Crusades. But he did it from the bounty of his own mind, and not because he was required to by the circumstances of the time. The Crusaders, like most people, found it difficult to hate those they never knew, and also found it difficult to despise their equals, and often their superiors, in skill and judgment, and also in generosity of deeds, in chivalry, and in many fine points of gentry and gentility, which Europe lacked almost totally. Again, we find this strange emotion in man springing up. And on the crests and shields of the great families of Europe, nearly all of them, you will find occasionally a crescent set, which means that one of these crusaders brought back a Muslim wife. Also, the Muslims more or less opened their schools, their ways of life, their roads and courses to scholars from the West, showing very little revengefulness, very little intention or tendency to hold old grudges. And from the temporary kingdom of Jerusalem and from uh, certain seats in Byzantium and Antioch, Christendom came closer and closer to the East. Trade began to develop exchange and barter. Out of the debris of these situa of situations rose such world-changing structures as the great empire Republic of Venice, with its mercantile traveling to all parts of the world. <coughs> Here then was a tying together of nations, a building up of common understanding. And right at this moment of which we are speaking, we have another interesting ambassador of various wills. For just at this time, a Venetian traveler named Ser Marco Polo became perhaps the uh, original globetrotter. Uh, this man, who outdid Stoddard and other travelers, went far into the east. He traveled to the most distant parts. He became friendly and conversant with the ways of Asia. He was accepted everywhere as an honored friend. In fact, there were times in which he was besought to stay and remain helper and advisor to these people. He turned down many glamorous and rewardful opportunities to finally return to his own state. Returning, he dared to write the story of his trip, and he wrote the book of Ser Marco Polo. And this probably had an effect in Europe not much less than the Crusades. It was a bombshell. He described the splendors and glories of Eastern courts. He spoke of the scholars and the wonders that he had seen of temples of gold inlaid with jewels, of brilliant and wonderful scholars, of art sacred and profane beyond our estimation, of deep philosophies about the soul and of life and of death and all the mysteries of human existence, and of wonders of men who climbed up ropes and disappeared in the air and grew mango trees in a half an hour. Well, the effect of this on Europe was as you might expect it to be. When Marco was on his deathbed, uh, the priests who heard his final confession besought him with all fervor uh, to admit that he had fabricated the whole thing and had been a deceiver from the beginning. But old Marco died, and it is said that his last words were, it was true. They couldn't do anything with him. But his book gained an amazing popularity, and people began to think of this land beyond the horizon of the known as a great and strange and wonderful place. This also, of course, had its natural repercussions, because the very sound of words like gold 
and jewels and silk and spices and rare goods created much desire among the merchants and the rich. And it was only a few couple of centuries later that we learn how the uh, dukes of Medici exchanged horses with the princes of China and Mongolia and were on very chummy terms with them. Another great break, a break that changed our attitude and began to reveal to us not a round globe, but a much larger flat one than we had ever known before. The round part was yet a little way off. That had not yet been remembered. There was uh, San Marco Polo within the midst of his adventures. Two things happened right in Europe that began to have long shadows upon future times. For at this time there was born perhaps the greatest leader of the church up to that period, and that was Thomas Aquinas, better known as St. Thomas Aquinas, the creator of a system of philosophy called Thomism. He was called the Dr. Angelicus. He was the greatest scholar the Roman Church ever produced. Had Aquinas been born in another time, he might have followed in the way of Einstein or Jeans or one of the other great scientists of the day because he was a born scientist. But as he came in a time which was closely confined within the narrow boundaries of his faith, he could only operate within an area of sanctified ground. But in this area he created prodigious results. And he began to move religion out of the dark ages, out of the completely locked condition in which it had descended, largely due to the, uh, the prevailing illiteracy and the impossibility of a broad perspective on any subject. It is not a case of where, as some may think, the church was trying to strangle Europe. Europe was nothing to strangle and the church had no power to strangle it with. The clergy and the laity were dying together of plain ignorance and there was no one wiser than the others to save the situation. A very provincial attitude had complete control. But about the time we mention, just around the year 1200, we begin to see the breaking through of things. Part of the breaking through was done by the blessed Albertus Magnus, Albert the Great, who was the master of Aquinas. Albert the Great apparently was great of name and great of nature, but small of stature because on one occasion when he was receiving audience with the Pope and the Pope had finished blessing him, the Pope said to him, Albertus, rise. <laughs> Albertus said, I'm sorry, Your Holiness, I'm already standing up, which would indicate that he was not a very large man. <laughs> Aquinas was quite different inasmuch as Albertus Magnus was very much given to mysticism, to Bible studies, and to alchemy. Aquinas did not go into the alchemy, nor into these other uh, situations, but he brought out something that was about due and certainly saved the church. The point that he made and the summary of all of the philosophy of Aquinas is simply this, that there are two parallel roads that lead to truth. One is faith. Uh, leading to revelation, and the other is reason leading to philosophy. These two are not incompatible, because at a certain point, faith and reason in their ultimate form uh, mingle again, and from philosophy and revelation united, man perfects his insight and achieves all that man can achieve. By reason, man conquers all things around him. By faith, he achieves identity with all things within him. A man between 
the within and the around, finds equilibrium by the balance of the heart and mind. Now, um, I must admit that we are saying this in a manner somewhat simpler than Aquinas did because it took him several thousand pages of bad Latin to do it. But this is the substance of his idea. And what did it do? It presented the church with a pattern called scholasticism. And this pattern, scholasticism, was to break and overthrow the earlier forms of church philosophy which had arisen around the teachings of St. Augustine of Hippo. And this Augustinianism we call patristic philosophy. The scholastics uh, relieved man of the patristic limitations and bestowed their own upon him. Uh, these limitations did not pinch much at first because the new bread was overwhelmingly helpful and hopeful. But in the course of time, and with human minds closing always around ideas and strangling them to death, the scholasticism also fell into evil times and ended by a critical, analytical, literalistic attitude toward everything. It was therefore necessary, about 600 years later, for scholasticism to be broken apart in order that the new phoenix of humanism could arise from the ashes thereof. But in that time, scholasticism, which for some reason that is not entirely clear, perhaps the personality of Aquinas himself, which was a very positive one, but at that time, in the presence of many privileges and opportunities, the church decided to follow him. He gradually gained in uh, precedence. His philosophy became the official <laughs> philosophy of his church. And this philosophy naturally divided into two parts. It emphasized the tremendous importance of man's internal life. It pointed out and justified <clears throat> the earliest patristic ideas on monasticism, on uh, the life of poverty, on uh, asceticism and things of that nature. In this way, it did not interfere with the idea of the church of the great need of man for spiritual salvation through repentance and through the purification of his life. On the other hand, the teachings of Aquinas made possible the gradual integration of man's knowledge of things outside of him. And this was important. For up to that time, men had firmly believed uh, that uh, the earth was simply fashioned in order to be slipped in under man at the time of the fall so that he would not continue to fall indefinitely. It had no other purpose. Grain grew that men could eat it. It had no significance in itself. The world was made for man, and it was solemnly believed that the stars were chandeliers hung in the sky so that he could see his way home in the dark. That was the way thinking was. Man was a completely unique thing, uh, created separately and specifically, capable of salvation, or no other creature capable of it. That man had a kind of life that separated him from all other kinds of life and made him master of them all by the mere circumstance of his own existence. Man was indeed a total and complete Brahmin. The world was fashioned merely for his use and pleasure. Nothing else was of importance. The things that happened in the world were not the result of climate or of laws or of processes or of cause and effect or of vigilance and neglect. They were all dynamic, miraculous happenings of providence. Plagues were sent not by any circumstance, but by God's will. War, suffering, death were all simply experiences to test the faith of man. They had no other important value. Man's 
complete allegiance to God was subject to a little controversy, however, in one particular. The early church recognized, because of biblical statement, the importance of the physician. And the only branch of learning that did not fall to pieces was medicine. Not that it had a particularly good integration at that time, but a certain amount of moderate progress was permitted. And one of the old church saints tells us that we have our allegiance unto the physician, next only unto the Lord. Well, today we're not quite certain of the inspired nature of the American Medical Association, but we're willing to be convinced if they can do it. <laughs> but in those days, the physician really had it rather well, you know, because he was next only to the bishop, and his word was law. As Paracelsus pointed out a little later, however, although his word was highly valued, it is not certain that he said very much at least anything of any great importance. Uh, medication consisted of bleeding, purging, uh, various kinds of poultices, and almost totally the theory of treating the area that hurt the most. There was really practically no general knowledge, no autopsy was permitted, no dissection was known in Europe, and uh, the healing arts were in the keeping of a combination of the doctor, the barber, and the local butcher. Incidentally, uh, the Caesarean section was performed by hoggelders at that time. A good doctor did not wish to have the unpleasantness of having his robe spattered with blood. He came in robes with a velvet cloak, a tall conical hat, and a girdle of gold. And usually, when he diagnosed, he sat several feet from the patient and touched his body with a long wooden stick. You can imagine how you could take a pulse through a fishbowl. But anyway, it was the practice of the time. So this wasn't doing too well, even though it was sanctified and privileged. With Aquinas, uh, the mood changed. The way was prepared for man to recognize that religion did not prevent him from being a lawyer, a judge, a merchant, did not mean that he could not or should not read and write, also that it permitted him to study a little dialing or a little geography or a bit of navigation if it pleased him. He could study, he could become learned. The professor was born somewhere in this mystery and confusion of things. And the professor began to have status, almost equal to the doctor. By degrees, the rights of learning and education excited men into the research and sciences. And as might be imagined, they came with great naivete to the subject. At that time, a science had no scientific foundation. Some observation a great deal of tradition and a little sorcery would help. So your scientist in those days had bottles in his laboratory and went out at night and invoked demons at crossroads. Those seem to be the best ways of finding out things. And as we know, almost every form of progress has been directly or indirectly attributed to the devil at some time. This uh, gave rise to a number of pseudosciences to a great deal of speculation, but it also made possible the gradual introduction into Europe of the standard texts of the Arabic writers, who were very much further advanced. It made possible for the Roman writings of Galen and the Arabic writings of Avicenna or Ibn Sena uh, to come into the schools of Europe. The man could study the eruptions of Mount Etna or other things that interested him, without being convinced that he was wasting his time, which should be spent entirely on his knees in prayer. Europe was moving towards a little intellectual freedom, and this freedom was fast intriguing the mind. It was the basis of a new outlook. By reason and philosophy, says Aquinas, 
man can explore nature and become master of its processes. It went no further in practical form at that time, perhaps, but it placed the blessings of the faith upon the exploration of natural phenomena. And we find early texts arising on the history of storms. We find men beginning to measure earthquakes. We even find some very early diagrams of the craters on the moon. In every direction, the mind was spreading out to take hold of ideas. And this, of course, was the beginning of the awakening of the European uh, culture as we know it. So right at the same time, another incident occurred, uh, which certainly deserves our very definite attention. At that time, King John of England was forced by his barons to sign the Magna Carta. And the Magna Carta was signed in the first quarter of the 13th century, just within 15 or 20 years of this critical time. For this paper was signed while most of the great leaders and the great motions which we have discussed were in function. Now, the Magna Carta was quite a complicated situation in itself. We cannot go into all the details of it, but in our public schools today, we are reminded, if only passingly, that it is the origin and the inspiration for the American Bill of Rights. The Magna Carta was the first head-on assault against the divine right of kings. Now, it, uh, it did not end the situation, but it certainly began to strengthen the position of the people and to, in measure, weaken the despotism of entrenched aristocratic groups. Strangely enough, the Magna Carta was not a reform brought about by the people. It was forced upon the king by his own nobility, the barons. Those who had come finally to rebel, not necessarily against monarchy, but against a very bad king who was giving them much trouble. The Magna Carta uh, began, however, to bestow upon various branches of government certain inalienable rights and privileges. It decentralized total leadership and prepared the way for the concept of the board of directors or the trustees or those who must share in the responsibility of decision. It also gave to the private citizen certain rather sketchy rights. Sketchy because in the original form they were full of loopholes, but important because men gradually began to forget the loopholes and gathered and rallied valiantly around the generalities which this document contained and forced these generalities uh, to become subjected to continuous improvement, reform and refinement until what we might call civil law became a fact. The Magna Carta uh, was forced upon the king. He did not want to sign it. But uh, he was unable to avoid the pressure because open rebellion was resting near him. As a result of this document being signed against the will and pleasure of the king, even though in the original document it is legally presented in a fairly nice way to make it seem as though John was cooperating, he was not. He had no traffic with the idea at all, but he could do nothing about it. As a result of this, immediately, the Church of Rome, which at that time, of course, controlled kings and commoners, thundered out its objections, rejected the Magna Carta totally and forever. This caused quite a little stir, because for the first time, it threw religious and civil law into a serious feud. Up to that time, uh, secular law 
as relates to the management of kingdoms and of states was almost an arm of religious law. Religion determined the laws by which the state was ruled, and then the rulers administered the laws of religion. Religion was primary. The signing of the Magna Carta, which was therefore a, an open rebellion against the vested authority of a king sanctified by the sacraments of the church, this set up a nasty situation. A situation which was far more meaningful in those days than now. It forced the barons who had demanded uh, the Magna Carta to then turn their attention upon the church and to directly and indirectly require that the church accept certain reforms and modifications of policy from them. This was a delicate business, which could easily end on the rack. It was, however, by the very confusion of the times and by the circumstances of the Crusades, which made the entire situation possible by deflecting the larger part of the manpower of Europe into the Holy Land, by all these conditions and others, the Magna Carta was made to stick. It remained, and by degrees it became obvious that the church would have to exercise certain tact, that it could control a measure of things. It could control religious life within a country. It could control to a degree the ruler of the country if that ruler was of that faith. It could do everything possible to place key men in various high offices in order to favor the various purposes of the church. But it also might well be confronted by a parliamentary body which it could not control and which could function even in the presence of anathema. This began to modernize, we will say, or liberalize the attitude of the church in the various countries and in the various political systems in which it found itself. It had to realize that it could not hold complete temporal authority. Out of this came a kind of an inferiority complex for a while, and the church began to suddenly see that it was being moved from a position of total leadership to a position of conditioned moral influence. From the time of the Magna Carta on, we see the church rapidly rebuilding its fences. We see it beginning to exercise more and more of its moral sphere of influence and more or less avoiding head-on collision with the political factions. And now let us see in the 12th century what the church was trying to gain. Uh, we must realize that in those days the uh, power of the church was such that it did not actually have very much practical interest in the entire question. The interest was essentially theological. Uh, the uh, change of situations did not actually interfere much either with the revenues of the church or with its prestige, particularly among the people. Its real cause of concern was the fact that it honestly believed, no doubt, that as the shepherd of men, that it had a moral responsibility and this responsibility was to govern the conduct of all men, to preserve as far as possible their obedience to the canonical law. The barons of England uh, broke through this pattern. The barons had not disobeyed the church. The barons had disobeyed the sovereignty of an anointed king now, there was no question in the world that Rome was perfectly aware of the corruption of Jones. 
and probably did not particularly like him or find any particular profit in him inasmuch as he too was wasting funds that might well have gone to the church. But a principle was involved, and on this principle the church stood and ultimately fell. It would not acknowledge the right of man to question that which had been duly and properly and crowned and throned and sanctified unto God as a ruler. Thus the divine right of the king was the point of theological delicacy. And it was on this point that the anathema uh, was pronounced and the barons were declared uh, to have committed a sin against God. Of the secular arm of life. These aristocracies were for the most part nom nominally Catholic, and many of them produced a great treasure, benefit, and glory for the church. But these families, growing into power, also held certain rights apart from the church, and the privileges of these rights became more and more sedulously protected. The individual was determined uh, to preserve such freedoms and opportunities and rights as were his own. Also, the power of the church in the lower courts came to be questioned. And law and theology began to give way to law and equity. And we find the uh, criminal no longer judged by God but judged by a jury of his peers a jury selected of others like himself man passing upon man and his conduct not God arbitrarily declaring justice and injustice all these patterns now as I think you will see made a rather strenuous century and we must begin to conceive now of what these patterns led to, how they affected uh, the reintegration of European consciousness. The first thing they all contributed to, more or less, was enlightenment, education, advancement. The European mind suddenly realized that in its weakness it could never be victorious in anything. The king began to realize that a stupid peasantry was no shining jewel in his crown, that there was no uh, credit, prestige, or honor in ruling the mindless. It was also recognized that in an emergency where need arose, it was rather important that someone could think and that in all situations requiring leadership in the development of nations and of states, the need for the statesman appeared, the need for the scholar, the need for the educator, even the need for the beginnings of a scientific pursuit, and also the need of the voyager, the navigator, the traveler, the adventurer, and most of these needs had to spring from a sense of emancipation within the soul. A man had to have courage to go into distant places. He had to have enthusiasm to advance his way of life. He had to put his own soul into the things he was doing. And to do this, he must know what he is doing. And he must have something to do that captured not only his labor, but his imagination. Europe was coming out of a kind of coma, and man was reaching around to find purposes for his own existence. He found some of these purposes in the defense of his faith, as in the Crusades, in which, although he was not really defending, because he was in an offensive position, 
Still, he believed he was defending. He believed that he was making the greatest possible sacrifice for the greatest possible good that he could conceive. But out of the crusade, something else was happening that was to affect the whole situation also. During the Crusades, we have the most polyglot administration of situations recorded in history. And from the ample perspective of his great divan uh, in uh, Baghdad, Saladin made a very astute remark, namely that the European or Christian Crusaders were not defeated by the Saracen alone. They were defeated by the confusion of unleadered mobs. The complete lack of understanding of leadership and mostly of cooperation. All these little individuals carrying their feuds to the walls of Jerusalem and killing each other before the Saracens could shoot them down with their bows and arrows. This was one of the tragedies of the Crusades, and this is one of the reasons why the Arabs, though technically in many cases in an inferior position, were able to win. First, they had a cause. They were protecting their own land. Secondly, they had a conviction, their religion, which was strong within them and which bound them not only uh, to the faith but to the protection of its sacred places. And even more than this, they had 500 years of education by which they had learned to work together and had buried their own feuds. They had been fortunate, of course, in having a leader that they commonly respected in Saladin. Europe had no such leader that it commonly respected. So we see for 200 years nearly the manpower of Europe drawn off into the Crusades. With this manpower, because of the nature of it, went not only the yeomanry, the serfs, who, and uh, bondsmen who worked upon the lands of the lords and barons and counts and dukes and princes and whatnots, but also the aristocrats themselves. At the head of each of these little processions of soldiers going forth to holy war was a group of, compa of comparison knights upon their prancing horses. These knights were the gentry. They led the others. And as a result of that, the entire feudal system of Europe went out to die. Many of them, most of them, either did not come back or returned too late. Wars in those days were not fought in years or ten year periods. Many of these men who went out to fight in the Crusades did not return, not because they were killed, but because they died of old age before they could get back. It was a situation in which there were ulterior motives lurking behind all of this problem. One of these ulterior motives was revealed by the remarks of Saladin. When all this gentry arrived at Acre and other centers along the Muslim front, these gentries were not on speaking terms. In fact, most of them hardly understood each other's languages. Each one wished to lead everything. Each one, by some right or reason, had peculiar privileges that came before every other consideration. And so they haggled, and they argued, and they feuded, and they rattled and clanked their armors but they came to no united front. This means that back home, where they came from, they had never had a united front either. They had lived in their little castles on the hills, defending themselves against intruders, living a kind of gentle, roisterous existence, uh, with little thought for anything except their own comfort and security. There was no concept of a general government, and the only over-government that existed was the church. 
And this government uh, rested rather lightly even then upon those in privileged positions. Outside of the great incentives to uh, save holy places, there seems to have been a well-worked-out subterfuge, namely the growing power of certain families, certain groups. These groups have begun to sense within themselves what we might term nationalism. They were aware that these scattered feudal districts could be bound into great states and that over these great states still greater princes might arise. And while the Crusaders were out on their mission of salvation, these large families and special groups moved in behind them in Europe and broke the, pre the feudal system completely apart. Uh, when these who did return got home, they found their small rights swallowed up in the greater privileges of the strong. And in this transition, we see the rise of the first great national entities of Europe. We find the beginnings, not the full forms, but the beginnings of what were to be France and Germany and Italy. We find the uh, various factors at work that were to bind together cities and states and to lift dukes and counts and princes to the final state of empiric lines. Name the world, of course, was difficult. But even this had its part to play because in nationalism you had a larger family pattern, a tremendous amount of energy that had previously been wasted in remaining apart was now available for common labor and common effort. This led, of course, to both positive and negative results. The rise of these larger national blocks made possible a more advanced method of life for many people. It gave them freedom from the constant pillaging of their neighbors. It made possible uh, their retaining their lands more uh, safely and the possibility of living a full life on the earth without being taken away to war began to grow bright for many. On the other hand, these, uh, these combinations resulted in larger individual political units with the result that major wars could come into existence, which had previously been almost impossible. The only other way that you could have had major wars was probably like the Crusades, a group of nations uniting on an objective. But now, comparatively large groups with powerful resources could be locked in wars for 10, 20, 50, or 100 years due to the slow movement of military machinery and military tactic at that time. So these became both curse and blessing. Uh, the wall city came to be of very little value, and most of the value that remained uh, disappeared with another uh, development which rose largely again in this critical period and was imported from Asia. And this was the so-called discovery of gunpowder. Now, gunpowder has had many uses. Uh, but one that we seldom realize or think too much about has been its psychological effect on the equality of man. Gunpowder ended, for example, uh, the age of chivalry. It ended the knight in armor riding at the head of his group, fairly well protected behind a reasonable fortification of boiler iron, and almost invulnerable. It also ended uh, the wall city and the protection of the high wall against which the primitive engines of battering rams and so forth took a very difficult and lengthy time to make impression. Uh, Gunpowder made the humblest yeoman 
the poorest soldier in the army, the one who might be responsible for the death of the king. This was a psychologically very important and reformed entirely military tactics with the leaders moving to the back rather than riding out in front. <laughs> the uh, fancy for riding out in front uh, took a serious reverse. <laughs> Gunpowder not only did uh, this important thing, but it began to create vast uneasiness among the great. It became more and more obvious that the power of privileged groups to utterly and completely control peoples was fast disappearing. Uh, prior to that time, uh, with luck, uh, the despot might have a comparatively smooth time. But with these changes, despotism became ever more hazardous, ever more difficult to maintain and allegiances shifted their patterns. Just as the church had been forced to a new position by the Magna Carta, so the principalities and dukedoms of Europe and their rulers were forced to a new position by the advent of gunpowder. It became no longer possible to control by force alone. The reign of force, the power of physical persuasion, the fear of physical retaliation, these began to lose their general effectiveness. And we find a very important psychological change coming, and that was the rise of government by persuasion, uh, by winning the confidence of peoples, by attempting to create uh, some closer affinity, uh, new focal points, uh, placing a censorship upon the luxury of princes, making it ever increasingly dangerous for the prince to lose the confidence of his people. The final and terrible example of this probably, of course, came much later in the French Revolution. But the seeds of the French Revolution were sowed at the time of the Crusades for a new pattern, a new way of life, was distinctly on the rise, and against this motion no one uh, could exercise a truly restraining power. So for a moment to summarize our, our Phoenix cycle pattern, we see how uh, the period from 6 to 1200 resulted in the gradual falling apart of a world that had received a powerful impulse at the time of the rise of Islam. Islam, in the 600 years that followed its rise, uh, integrated its own position, tied itself closely into the Eastern way of life, and came finally to such a powerful unity that it was tempted to attack Western civilization. During these 600 years, Western civilization had been more or less in a doldrum. The thing that really saved it more than anything else was its so-called barbarian fringe. Uh, during the collapse of the Roman Empire and during the decadence of the Dark Ages, a great number of peoples have remained essentially untouched. The culture and civilization had moved around Byzantium and the Roman center in Italy. The outskirts, the far-flung fragments of the old Roman colonial empire, had remained a pretty stout group. They had, of course, received Christianity, and had from this circumstance added one important uniting factor. But when uh, the East moved in upon the West, it could not move in upon Florence, or upon Rome, or upon London. It had to move in through the Balkans, and back in the area of South Russia, and in so doing, it ran against the newly converted Christian people themselves still in a highly integrated state of vigorous barbarism. These people, however, were converted to the Western way of life and became its great exponents, 
its great protectors. And because these people were still vigorous, and also because the Mongol Empire had overreached its reasonable boundaries, Genghis Khan had been forced to spread his armies too thin to control all of Asia. Also, he was near the end of his own life. And in all these strategic circumstances, the final wave that struck Europe was not the full impact of the great Mongol horde. Had it been, it probably would have carried everything before it. It was reduced by long separation from its source of supplies. It was reduced also by the same thing that Europe suffered, namely so many wars over so long a period of time that generations of men were exhausted. Due to these circumstances, perhaps historically, we find that the Muslim world did not at that time succeed in conquering all of Europe. Also, there were dissensions between the Mongols and the Arabs. There were numerous uh, feuds in various parts of the world that still occupied some attention. Uh, altogether, Western Europe was spared. But Western Europe had seen the handwriting on the wall. Western Europe realized that it could no longer drift along in illiteracy and ignorance. It could no longer live upon the simple sophistry that it was the only existing culture. It could no longer assume that only Europe was important. And this was the challenge. The challenge that we refer to today as the challenge of healthy competition. Europe suddenly became aware that other people would do something with Europe if the Europeans did not. This was a challenge. It opened the way uh, to Europe be preparing to defend itself and its boundaries and to defend its own orders rather than to assume that no one else was of importance. Meeting this challenge of a rising Islamic power and a tremendous unfoldment of strength in Asia, Europe by necessity united, brought its various elements into the best patterns possible and began to think in terms of strong alliances a strong federation of powers. Now against this, of course, you had reactionaries. You have the cry of the church against the rights of man. You have the still continuing tendency of all nobility to exploit peoples. But we also have the emergence of something else, uh, which education always <coughs> brings. Education inevitably causes the individual to pause. It causes him to reflect a little. And it attacked one of the great problems of European life and attacked it firmly. And that is the problem of the individual having no social consciousness, total social unadjustment. It began to be rather obvious with uh, the breaking up of the feudal system and the arising of the embryos of nationalism that there were allegiances necessary. It was difficult indeed for the uh, yeoman and the serf and the fief to find very much of glamour in the feudal lord who uh, ruled him. He was very close to this man. He saw just exactly how uncouth he was, how he wasted and squandered his means, and how he practically spent his life in debauchery and conspiracy. It was not easy to have any great affection for such a person, and religion supplied the link by which the serf was morally obligated to serve his lord. Of course, there was also the problem of land and tenancy and the need uh, of some way to make a living. But the inducements were not good, not essentially sound. But with the coming of nationalism, there came a new inducement to each citizen, namely that the state must be strong. That the citizen owed not only a duty to himself, but to the collective body of which he was a part it became essential for him to recognize that he depended upon the state 
for his own survival. He had learned some of these principles from feudalism, but they were brought home to him in a larger pattern. Also, most of the citizens of a state were somewhat further removed from their leaders. States composed of many communities. Uh, the leader was more grand, more glorious, and less available. These were important considerations, because men with imagination build virtues where they do not exist. And the brilliant leader over a large group, with his splendid entourage, began to be impressive and to gain the respect and admiration and awe and veneration of these peoples. So the leader became more or less the symbol of the state, and devotion to the leader was devotion to the state, and vice versa. Thus the preservation of the state began to involve many things previously never thought of. One was the common distribution of food. Under the feudal system, if the feudal lord was a man of some integrity, he held certain stores which were available to his tenants in time of famine. Under the state system, uh, various taxes or means were devised by means of which uh, available goods in emergency were procurable. The need to maintain these supplies, the need to preserve the treasury, uh, the need to maintain an army, these things came home directly to the individual. He was not maintaining an army for another, for a prince or a feudal despot, but for his own family, for his neighbors, for the people down the street, for the men he worked with. They now had a common share in the political situation. And as uh, a little more education added to this pattern, uh, we gradually begin to see the rudiments of a humanistic basis of relations and values. The rise of humanism follows very closely upon this situation, but our whole period of 600 years with which we are concerned leads approximately from the period 1200 to about the year 1800. Now the early parts of this period represent the building up of a system of life built upon Aquinas and the Magna Carta. And as in case of the previous cycles, it opened comparatively well. It opened with a lot of suffering, yes, but with a lot of momentum, a lot of dynamic, and a tremendous capacity to change things. Then having attained to a certain degree it likewise began to fall away. In this case, the falling away was a little different uh, from uh, the situations that had previously existed. We are reminded a little bit, perhaps, of our present economic situation, uh, where it seems, perhaps, to many persons that we are on the verge of falling away into a recession. Just when it looks as though a recession might even lead to a depression, we suddenly find an important change in policy of government. We find the emergency created uh, by the advancement of electronics and the launching of the satellites suddenly seems to change everything. Whether this change will be more than temporary, we cannot say, but it brings in an unexpected factor, cutting through things. Now, the decline of Europe and its uh, destiny between the 12th and the 18th century was made eccentric by a series of these unexpected factors, factors which could have been prophesied as calculated risks, but the actual impact of these did not uh, exactly meet uh, the expectancy. The motion from the 12th century through the 13th and toward the 14th this tremendous motion resulting from the period of the post-Crusades, the rise of Thomism, the motion of the Eastern culture into Europe, first by way of Byzantium, the returning Crusaders, and then upward from Southern Europe, from Italy, from the Republic of Venice, from the great mercantile centers there, from the commerce of the Adriatic, 
and of the eastern Mediterranean and even North Africa. It moved into Europe and moved up through Europe into Rome, Florence, and finally into Germany and France. And this great cultural motion, which culminated uh, in the most brilliant period in European uh, medievalism, we know as the Renaissance. The Renaissance, therefore, was the golden age of the consequences of the Magna Carta and of Aquinas. The roots that were laid at that time, the roots of a larger, broader, and deeper relationship of things, the growing world of learning, the world of letters, the patronage of arts, the rise of great families, wealthed in many cases by the traffic with the East, uh, the splendid concept of a wider world, the restoration of ancient arts, the uh, effort to restore Greek philosophy, the effort to restore culture, uh, tremendous things uh, such as the great Florentine Academy of Lorenzo de' Medici. Uh, now everybody wanted to learn. Everyone wanted to know. Uh, nearly 700 years of waiting to find out had created a pressure. And into this pressure men moved, resolute in their determination to know. As one historian says, they wanted to know so badly that they found out a great many things that were not so. They, uh, they were moving tremendously, however, under uh, the pressure of this situation. Now also, in spite of the fact that Aquinas had moved uh, well within the order of sanctity, and uh, that the wounds of the Magna Carta had uh, more or less uh, healed over, if not underneath, uh, the streams of situation were also flowing from um, the Magna Carta and from Aquinas, and were moving inevitably towards another tremendous uh, eccentric that was thrown into the situation at this time, and that was the Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation was nothing more or less than the inevitable but slow developing consequence of the Magna Carta. Uh, things were getting uh, into a position in which uh, the right of the secular arm of life could not be any longer denied. It was just uh, one of those peculiar, dramatic inevitables uh, that placed this situation around the selling of papal indulgences. This had really very little to do with the fact. It was that little straw which added to the others finally broke the camel's back. But the back had been pretty swayed for a long, long time before that. And the rebellion of Martin Luther was not the rebellion simply of one priest against his own church. It was a rebellion of many minds within the church against certain policies. Therefore, Luther's, one of Luther's nearest and dearest friends, a faithful son of the church and one who remained there, Philip Melanchthon, became also another powerful arm of the Reformation. The Reformation arose not only outside the church but within it as a result of the gradually rising level of literacy and of general knowledge and the uh, use, the broad use of the leverage provided by the rationalistic philosophy of Aquinas. It was now possible to think and be orthodox at the same time, a most amazing and incredible state of circumstances, and people were making the most of it. This led uh, to what might be termed the glory of Europe. Here we find the great families vying with each other now in the extravagances of their contributions to culture. We, of course, don't uh, doubt that they also held a few private funds for other uses. But certainly, they were building galleries. They were uh, working in various uh, fields uh, to encourage arts, uh, to, uh, to bring the people into a greater participation in the crowning glory of a platonic Athenian commonwealth. And we find even some of the reactionaries talking in the terms that Florence and Rome would be the new great cities that corresponded to Athens and Alexandria in the ancient world. 
the dream of classical learning had come on with tremendous impact. Now, classical learning also presented a problem because in this case, in the 14th century, early 15th century, classical learning was a birth out of time. It was no longer in its own world. Actually, the Medici and the Borgias were not very close in their resemblance to Plato and Aristotle. Uh, they were a different breed entirely. They had different motives. They were not the simple, uh, homely, uh, underpaid and undernourished philosopher of the Greek school. Uh, they were not another barefoot Socrates. They were princes who became dilettantes of learning. Learning was a jewel in their crown. It was not something that changed their lives. It was an ornament. And this resulted in another direction, which was to hit education and to remain even to this day as an unsolved mystery. And that is how to get knowledge out of a man's head and into his life. That is still an unsolved riddle and promises to be so for quite a time to come. But it was getting into the heads of the Renaissance men. And they were also uh, beginning to recognize uh, a very important factor namely man's power to change the destiny of man. Heaven had been set back a little by the uh, circumstances surrounding uh, Savonarola and Bruno and other scientists within the church. Men who had begun to recognize uh, the importance of this thought of Aquinas that we should begin to explore the universe. And they could not explore the universe long without finding that man was an island in a great sea. And that on this island, men labored with men, struggled with them, fought with them, and died with them. And therefore, that man was a maker of destiny as well as an instrument of destiny. And the individuality of man, rising up, uh, began to change the complexion of the world. The Protestant Reformation had a profound effect upon Christianity. Now, some of this effect was important, some of it was good, and some of it was very bad. And as we look back over the general pattern of things, we have to realize that Protestantism, leading to Puritanism, was not the blessing that we might wish it could have been. Certainly, it did emancipate religion from the tyranny of hierarchy. It made more and more uh, emphasis upon uh, the right of man to personal worship, personal belief, and mystical communion with God according to the dictates of his own conscience. This, and, uh, this part was very good. But with it came a severance between man and the experience of religion as ritual, as ceremony, as music, as... Uh, religious pageantry as spectacle a man was not quite prepared for this change for some unknown reason the gods did not look as godlike in square toed shoes as they had in robes uh, it, it did not carry the same impact the loss of art the loss of great music in the church the loss of the emotional overtone uh, which held man to a certain splendid response within himself. These things began to uh, show serious deficits. There was need to meet these. And Protestantism has still been working with this problem, even today. And for many years, uh, tried to emphasize the lack of need for this. But the need for something which uh, responds or creates response in the emotional, aesthetic nature of man has always been a religious necessity and will always remain one as long as man must feel in order to believe. And he must have a powerful emotional incentive. Thus, in the breaking down of, uh, we might say, ceremonialism and art within the church, Art itself fell into the doldrums. And as soon as it was no longer guided by religion, art as value began to disappear. Art became hopelessly trivial 
as can be shown or examined by going through one of the great palaces of France, such as the Louvre, or the Palais Versailles, or the Palais Royal. In these we have masses of spindly, gold-legged chairs. We have atrocious copies of French sculpturing, and, uh, of Greek sculpturing, and cl semi-classical art. We have gigaws of all kinds, bric-a-brackery to the end of time, and no great strong art. Then, of course, let bereft of its spiritual guide and leadership, art was already to fall into the dilemma of the 19th century, which gave us such things as surrealism, post-impressionism, and caused a critic uh, or judge on an art exhibition which I had the misfortune to be one of the judges on not too long ago, to say, well, after all, if it means anything, it isn't art. That was what came as the final result. Now this, if it means anything, it isn't art, is only another way of stating a whole group of problems that arose at this time, the time of the Protestant Reformation, uh, which was a revulsion against the glory and grandeur of Florence and the Medici, a revulsion back to simple ways and simple things. But you have the same experience in daily life. I've heard so many people say that they wanted the simple life so badly they could hardly stand it. And when one gets it, he never wants to hear of it again. I know individuals who have said, I want to go off by myself and think. So they go somewhere, they last 12 hours and rush right back to civilization. They can't stand their own company. Now in this rebellion in European culture, men were fighting for something uh, less ornate, uh, more real, more simple, but they were talking with their minds and not their hearts. They were saying things according to conviction, according to pressure, according to prejudice or disillusionment. But when they began, began, began to simplify this thing down to the pattern which they themselves declared to be right, they were no better off. Because even when we know the old story of the Pilgrim Fathers that came here for religious liberty, and the first thing they did was to exile into the wilderness some of their own members, uh, it didn't work. It didn't produce a solution. But other factors now were also beginning to conspire. Here we have a Reformation rising, the glory of this period, the, uh, uh, the Renaissance, then the Reformation, things in Europe bubbling and boiling again, a tremendous conflict, a conflict which had gradually reached a new state of security. And I think the keynote of the Renaissance was smug security of achievement. Everybody thought it would last forever. No one questioned for a moment that the golden age had come, uh, that the splendor of things would lead to the eternal perfection of mankind. <coughs> that is, such perfection as was desirable. No one probably wanted to be very perfect. They simply wanted to be rich and happy. But these things seem to be within reach. The Renaissance had brought visible evidence of a splendid rebirth out of the darkness of the past. Under this splendid situation, the thing happens that always happens. Men began to be careless of the things which they had attained. We know, for example, that in this period, the great city of Venice was the mistress of Europe, one of the most powerful centers in the entire cultural, industrial, economic life of the world. But after having attained this end, Venice began to settle back and have time enough uh, to be unhappy about Venice. The Venetian merchant, having no enemy and no successful rival, had time for private feud. And this was the same general pattern throughout Europe. This glory increased avarice. It made individuals believe firmly that they could afford to neglect their progress and try to take wealth away from each other. It was a day of conspiracies in which great and able persons were poisoned because they were in the way of fools. And this situation weakened, inevitably, uh, the uh, fabric of Europe and created a new kind of martyr. Uh, 
the kind of martyr we have with Savonarola and Bruno, and to a degree the exile Dante. We have here now individuals thrown out of society because they dared to attack corruption. It was no longer heresy against God, it was doubting the works of men that got the human being into trouble. And he got into trouble very easily. This was continuing and a general air of sufficiency uh, continued to prevail until the next eccentric marked the pattern. And that eccentric was the discovery of the new world. And this came in in a very critical period, very near the center, just past the middle of this important era. And in the uh, discovery of the new world, the entire psychology of Europe was subjected to a tremendous change. Uh, the political circumstances involving the discovery of America are not part of our problem this evening. But I think we may say definitely uh, that for the first time, uh, Europe saw an open door to the front. Europe saw the possibility of expanding beyond the perpetual muddle of Europe itself. Europe had been boiling like a witch's stew for the best part of 14 centuries. It had boiled and reboiled until there was not much left to boil out. Everything was in continual ag agitation, ancient antagonisms and modern feuds. The struggles between classes, the struggles between groups and levels, all this struggle took place within a small area. The battle was highly confined and the pressures built up accordingly. Suddenly a great release was found in the, nav in the navigators and their voyages of exploration. A whole new world was discovered. This new world struck again a great and essential keynote. After the Renaissance, the Reformation brought with it a certain disillusion. Its effect upon arts was so pronounced that for centuries it paralyzed the creative, emotional genius of many countries. Uh, they just remained completely unimaginative. They had an orthodoxy, more orthodox than anything that had preceded them. But now this orthodoxy was too tight. Everything was closing in. And the great hope was an escape into a new way of life. Nobody believed with any enthusiasm that that new way of life could arise in Europe. The roots of the problems were too deep and too numerous. The hereditary feuds were too irreconcilable. Uh, the situation the individual had gotten into was so completely beset with results which he could not control that his only hope was speedy death. The only release from the uh, snarl into which everything had finally fallen was death. So life was not valued very highly in those days. Man prayed almost to die as release from the burden of living. This situation, the New World, created an entirely new group of thinkers. A, a group of potential leaders, of idealists and visionaries that had been frustrated and held back by the helplessness of their cause. There was no use mentioning it. It meant nothing. Nothing could be done. And these more brilliant persons, and education was producing more of them, were simply uh, placed in the position of knowing that things should be done, even suspecting what should be done, and being in a position where it was absolutely impossible to do it. Do you recognize the setting? We've got it right now, almost. Where a great many persons realize things that could be and should be done, but the individual is again impotent. The situation has locked him so tightly he is so completely dominated by group, by collective pressure, that the penalty upon the individual is terrific. In the old days we write, are we speaking of, the penalty for individuality might be death. 
Today, the penalty for individuality may be bankruptcy. But in both cases, the penalty is as heavy as the flesh can stand, and the individual is blocked. The new world became to a great many idealists throughout Europe the great focal point of hope. Here was a vast area, sparsely populated by strange feathered creatures who we later were called Indians because they had not come from India. These uh, peoples uh, ob obviously were not developing their natural resources very rapidly, and vast areas of good land awaited those brave enough to hazard the long and dangerous journey in a small boat dependent upon rains and winds and tides and would have the audacity to try to establish a way of life in the new world. Uh, of course, here was a, a combination of circumstances also because at that time we had a strong reactionary group moving into the new world. Exploration at that time was very largely under the control of Spain. And Spain at that time was still licking the wounds of the Inquisition. Uh, Spain was in a miserable state, and Spain also uh, was tremendously dominated by theology. So, of course, in the real spirit of the occasion, Spain claimed the new hemisphere totally for its own and looked around Europe to see if there was anyone who would say no. And at that moment, there just wasn't a single voice of objection raised. The reason being that Spain was then, in spite of its numerous difficulties, a greatly feared state with supposedly almost an invincible military arm. This uh, situation in Spain, backed as it was by the, most of the European Christian world, and uh, unable to move because of the moral prestige of the church which was thrown to Spain and demanded the allegiance of the rest of Europe to the purposes of Spain, this situation left a sort of a miserable spot. But in this miserable moment, when again it looked as though history was going to follow an old, old course and that the Inquisition would be set up in the new world, and that uh, the aborigines would end up speaking Spanish and quoting Latin, another situation broke into the picture. And that little situation was the Spanish Armada. The Spanish Armada, which had uh, as its cause certain misunderstandings between Henry VIII and the Church of Rome, which resulted in the... Uh, loss of influence and authority and prestige by Cardinal Wolsey and the rise of the Church of England, uh, this situation was rooted definitely in the feud that started with the Magna Carta and ended up with England creating its own uh, church and uh, removing the power of Rome. Rome, which did not like that very well at that time, uh, began to counterplot the situation, and after failing to get Queen Elizabeth of England married to a Spanish prince and make a sort of an infiltration that way, uh, the final showdown came with the Spanish Armada. Now, the Spanish Armada, due to natural circumstances and also to the skill of the English uh, the seafaring men, came to a dismal defeat. And with this defeat was the end of Spanish psychological domination of Europe. The defeat of the Armada was a blow from which Spain as a world power never recovered. Actually also, it was the end of Spain's extravagant, fantastic claim in the New World. For immediately after the Armada, England, Holland, and other countries began to colonize and began to extend their spheres of influence into the Western Hemisphere. Out of this situation also now arose greater courage, greater determination to build in the West a world and a way of life that was to be a complete escape mechanism 
from the European uh, situation. This may in some way be a kind of legitimate heredity because to a large degree this definite tendency to escape has made perhaps the modern American into the greatest escapist in history. He has this instinct in him, this instinct to get away from authority, to resent discipline, and gradually uh, to attempt at least uh, the management, total management of his own conduct. Under the colonizing plan, we find rising in Europe a group we know as the Utopians. The Utopians were the ones who began to see the possibility of a great world change. And they desired greatly and desperately to make this change come about. Uh, they wrote extensively. They created a literature. They fired the imagination of Europe. And out of this firing of the imagination, a double-pronged achievement was attained. One achievement was uh, the rapid development of independent thought and action on the Western Hemisphere. And the second was a rapid liberation of man from the one hemispheric concept of European education. Men not only explored the Western Oceans, but they sailed out between the columns of Galen and Avicenna and dared to demand a free intellectual life in Europe. Ergo, immediately, uh, the uh, doubts, circumstances, conditions which had led up to this period began to flame in Europe, producing the great movements toward liberty the great movements which were to be climaxed in a series of bloody or bloodless revolutions. Changes that were to break down uh, all of the glories of the Renaissance and to throw the total emphasis of all human culture upon man himself. Now this also had its difficulties because this emphasis thrown totally upon man began to achieve its end at the expense of man's moral and spiritual life. We find man becoming so important to man that he forgot there was anything else but himself. And from a total state of inferiority, he developed an aggressive state of superiority, in which he began to believe firmly that he was lord of all that he surveyed, that he could do anything that he wanted to do, and that he was all ready to go forth uh, as a full-fledged behaviorist. But he wasn't quite. The uh, climaxing of this situation, the results of all these patterns moving together, uh, meet together in the form of the episodes and situations which introduce the next great cycle, which is still in progress, the cycle which we will have to consider next week as focusing around the critical year of 1800. And we hope to show uh, at that time how distinctly this great cyclic motion again brings about a major crisis met by a new release of spiritual resource. And as we are now in that cycle, perhaps we can learn something of the decline of the resources why it occurs, and what we may expect, provided there are not too many exceptional breaks in the pattern. The breaks, however, are becoming more regular. The regular patterns are being broken through by innumerable factors. Still, the grand pattern remains, and we are now in the midst of the next great cycle from the one which we are now discussing. And that cycle we will begin to consider next week, beginning with the year 1800 A.D. and dealing on through to our present time and perhaps of something of that time that lies around the corner. No, if we don't get you out of here, you'll be here all night, so I think we'd better stop.